And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with the Game Boy Geek. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today, we're going to be going to storehouses to go grab rings and chalices and books. We're going to be bringing them into the last known abbey, and we're going to be stashing them into different rooms to keep them secret and to score points by doing so. We're going to be doing this together in a game called Templar, The Hidden Treasures. From Queen Games, it's two to five players, plays eight, ages eight and up, plays in 60 minutes or less. So let's take it out, show you how it's played. I'll see you on the other side. In Templar, you are trying to get goods that are in the storehouse and get them into the abbey and you're trying to stash them uh, amongst the different rooms in the abbey and score points for having them stashed there. Each player takes the color of their choice and gets 10 character cards, a final scoring card we'll talk about later, and there's three goods that the game has in it or types of goods. There's rings, chalices, and books. And to start the game, each player of their color gets to have rings of the different types. So we have two circle rings, two square rings, and one octagon ring. In this case we get one ring of each, and two of the types we have two of them. Since the major way of scoring points is putting uh, valuables and stashing them in rooms, let's talk about how a turn normally works. Everybody has those 10 cards. For the first round only, everybody's going to take one of these cards. They all have the same 10 cards. They're 10 different characters. Everyone's going to select one and play it face down, and then as soon as everybody has it, they simultaneously flip it up and going around and clockwise, everyone gets to take an action. So let's talk about what these cards do. Now you only play one card at a time, but I'm gonna show you some of them in, in uh, groups because it makes sense. These three are monks. And the iconography here is, this is how many places you can move your own pawn on the board, up to one, one room. Then you can place up to three of your uh, valuables in there. And the icons here is the star is a ring, the book is a book, and that's a chalice there, the little yellow thing. This guy lets you move up to two rooms, then stash two uh, valuables. This guy lets you move up to three rooms, but then stash one valuable. So I'm the yellow player, and let's say I chose the guy that moved uh, up to one, and then stash three things. So I move one room in here, which was yellow, and then I get to stash three rings. And so I'll take a ring here, and I'll put it. Now remember, rings is, is a star on the board, so I'll put, a I'll put a ring there. Now notice some areas have like a table that, that is all joined together. If I put a ring here, the only other ring that can go there is the same kind, meaning a circle. I could not put a uh, octagon or a square ring in the same area uh, that you know of stars but since these are separated you can put any type there so I moved one I stashed three that would be the end of my turn Stephanus is the illustrator he can move up to two rooms and he'll score as many points of however many pawns other than himself that's in the room because he's showing him their illustrations so let's say the red player is the one to play that he can move up to two rooms but he decides just to move one and there's two other pawns in there the yellow guy we just showed you this guy's the abbot we'll show you what he does later but he would get two points right away and that would be his turn for using the illustrator benjamin allows you to move up to three spots and then move at any time during that movement you can pick up uh, any ring and take it into another room and it can be anybody's ring your own or somebody else's so maybe the blue guy played that and he's going to move up to three he's going to go one He's gonna take this ring with him, go two, and he's gonna place it here. And this is useful because uh, people get, um, you know, sometimes they can get one room with all their stuff and get a huge score. So he's trying to maybe uh, move it around so he doesn't get such a big score in that room. Porticus allows you to move the locked door and you instantly get one point. So let's say the green player plate was the one to play that. The door starts here. And maybe he places it here. Uh, so he doesn't want this guy to get back. He doesn't want the, the abbot to get in there. This is the white abbot that we showed you. He can move up to two and then he scores everything that's in that room. So let's take a look at what this does. So he moves the abbot, whoever played that card, uh, goes into here and he's gonna score everything that's in this room. And then they flip over. The chalice, once they get flipped over, they have a little cross sign for the scoring marker. The chalice gets you five points. So the green would have gotten five points right away. The book gets you three points. So he, the blue would have gotten three. And each ring gets two points, but you only have to flip over one of them. So the blue guy gets flipped over, he gets two points. The yellow guy gets flipped over, he gets two points. The red guy, he only has to flip one over, but he gets four points, two for each ring, because rings in this room 
Uh, only one of them has to get flipped. So if he had multiples, only one would get flipped and all the others still score. But this shows that that can actually score later in the game. So the rings are the lowest value of two, but they can score multiple times, which make them pretty cool. Now, when the abbot moves into a new room, there's a little white guy here called the spy. He follows him and stays one room behind and the abbot cannot go into the room where the spy is. So essentially the, the spy is kind of making him continue a path and he can't just keep jumping back and forth and scoring rooms. So now that he's here, the abbot can't go this way. Of course, he could kind of circle around, but there's a there's a locked door here, if you remember. So you're playing locked doors to stop him from scoring maybe, and you have to go different ways uh, and that you can't go backwards because of that spy. It's a pretty cool mechanic there. This is the prior. He moves up to three. You get automatically one point and nothing of goods can happen there. You can't stash stuff, you can't move stuff, and you can't score stuff who's in the room with the prior. So if before the abbot was moved, this guy was moved, one, two, he can move up to three rooms. If he was standing in this room before that person played that abbot card, this room would not have been able to get scored because the prior is there. Maria allows you to take your pawn, put it in the storehouse to get more goods. So you can take your pawn, let's say it was the L player, and pick any one of these storehouses. Uh, maybe he goes here. And what you do is you get to take each one of these in your own color. So from the game box or a bag that you have, um, you would take the two circle rings, the book, and the chalice, because that's what's here, two circle rings, a book, and a chalice. These would get wiped off and removed from the game completely. And you would then put these in front of you. These are now uh, items that you can now stash or part of your repository. So now in front of me, I have the four items that I took, plus I have the ring that I still didn't place from the beginning of the game. These are the ones that I can stash for now. The last card is the bells. When you play this, you're gonna add tiles to the storehouse and how many is depending on the card that you played previous because as you're playing these cards one at a time they're essentially you have your deck of all your cards and at the beginning of the game you have all of them and as you start to play the cards one at a time they are down face up like this and you're making a discard pile so as this discard pile is being gener uh, you know created once you play the, the bells the card just previous to it they all have numbers in the top right this says 10 that means i would add 10 to the storehouses so there's a bag that comes with the game and you have a lot of these uh these items you start with the ship here and you're going to count out 10. so you would essentially just be one and you go clockwise two three four five six this one's full so you'd go to the next one seven and you can't have more than one chalice. If this is the second chalice and this one has to move to the next one, it's full. And this one's full, this one's full, so then it gets removed from the game. And so essentially you do this until you have all 10 of them placed. Now you can play this bell card at any time. I could have only maybe have played three characters. Maybe I had three turns in a row where I played different characters and then I played the bells for some reason. Well, I still had these cards in my hand that were like this. After you play the bells, you always pick up your entire discard pile Add it to your hand so you have all your actions available for the next turn. So for the first round of the game only, everybody's simultaneously putting a card down, flipping it over, and somebody might have the same card as you and you do your actions. Starting with the second turn, you have to look around and whatever card is on the top of anybody's discard pile, you cannot play it. So even if I really want to play Benjamin, but one of the other players has just played it last turn, I can't play this. So it really limits your choices depending on what other people are doing that you can't do the action that someone else just did their last turn, which is probably one of the major mechanics in the game. It makes it interesting because it somewhat limits what you can do. The game ends when one person has at least one item stash in all 13 rooms in the Abbey, or when filling the storehouse, as I just showed you with the bag, if the bag is empty and still more need to be filled into the storehouse, that starts the last round and everybody including that person gets one last turn and then the game ends. And then you are, already have scores that you've been keeping the ground, uh, around the game as things were getting scored during the game. And then you do this final end scoring, which shows you that each person, depending on how many rooms you have diff, uh, something stashed in, you get this many points. So if I had 10 different rooms that I had my own color stashed in, even one item, I'd get 10 extra points and so on and so forth. And then at the end of the game, after you've done this for everybody, you, add up, you see who's the winner at the highest point total. All right, well, there's Templa. I first got to give a shout out to a guy named Mike, Mike Riesling, who uh, is a fan of my reviews, and he backed this on Kickstarter. He wasn't that interested in the game. He just really wanted the super special edition of Alhamra that came with it. So he just contacted me and sent me the game and said, I just would like you to have this. So thank you, Mike. What a nice and generous guy. 
Uh, the game, uh, I think it's a good solid family game. We got done playing it a bunch of times, you know, we looked at each other like, it was a good solid game, it's good. It wasn't bad, it wasn't great, it's just a good solid game. The things I like about it um, were sort of the, there's a lot of spatial elements going on. Because of that little spy creature uh, that's following uh, the abbot around, uh, as you score things, he can't go backwards. So when he, once he starts going down the places where there's no loops, you know he's not gonna be able to come back for a while. So you have to sort of read where he's going and try to get your guy ahead of him and start dropping and stashing out some stuff ahead of him. So as he starts to make his way around the abbey, you're gonna start scoring some points. So you're trying to figure out Where's he gonna go? So that's kind of a cool thing to think about. Also, the differences of playing around and with the different people. Um, sometimes you'll wanna go in a room with somebody. If they've got some treasure there, you're gonna wanna go there too, cause you know that they're not gonna like make anything bad happen. They're not gonna make the, the abbot skip that room. They're not gonna put the, the, the prior there and screw you. Uh, so sometimes it's good to kind of diversify and go in rooms with other people. But other times it's okay to maybe try to hoard off and just totally get one room, but you have to work really hard to score that room because the other, the other players are gonna be trying everything in their will to move your stuff out of there, to put in the prior there. They're gonna be trying to stop you. So there's a, a little bit interesting how it sort of works there, whether you're focusing on your own thing or trying to screw your neighbor. Uh, so there is some interesting things there. I like the idea that you can't play something that someone else played. Of course, that makes it harder with more players. The more players you have, the more cards are out there that you can't play, so it limits your, your ability. So the game gets harder as you have more people, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's easier with less people. Um, playing those cards is cool, going to the storehouse. There are some cool ideas there. Uh, so all in all, it was a decent game. Um, Queen Games obviously makes great games with great components. Again, this game, great artwork, great uh, components. The insert in the board, uh, it's just really great. Um, so the game's good. I, it's, you know, it's not a great game. It didn't wow me. It didn't really grab me like, oh, this is a great game or anything like that. It's just a good, solid game. I'd say it's not bad, not great, but sort of in the middle. It's okay. Just, eh, okay, good game. You might want to play with your family a couple times. And you know, we, when we were done, I said, yeah, well, we, we'd like to play this again. You know, it's not like, oh, I'm never going to play it again. But I couldn't imagine this one coming out a lot. Uh, especially with so many games being released this year. But it's, it's a solid family game that you might like if you like the theme, if you like what you've seen. You might want to check out the Templar Hidden Treasures. Hey, one more thing before you go. If you're about to drop a comment on this YouTube page for this video and you're expecting interaction or a personal response from me, uh, I recommend the place to do that is at my Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash thegameboygeek because I don't get notified when YouTube videos get comments on the Dice Tower Network because I don't own the channel. So if you want to interact with me directly, I'll see you at my Facebook page. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. <laughs>